2014. What another golden legacy to add to his collection. Thank you. Before we come to the next set of business, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery the Speaker of the National Assembly of the Republic of Serbia, Mrs. Maya Gojkovic. We now move to First Minister's question. Question number one, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister, uh, Alex Salmond. Officer, uh, I'm told this is my 215th session of, of First Minister's uh, questions. Uh, and later today, I'll be proud to meet uh, uh, a group of young carers uh, who have designed the Young Carers Tartan, which I'm proudly uh, wearing today. Uh, they are the people with experience and care. They have designed it with Black Cherry Studio, a Scottish print design company. The design has been registered with the Scottish Register of Tartans and, and it is available to anyone who has been in care. It is hoped that this will encourage more people with experience of care to claim their identity positively. And I am proud to wear it today. Presiding officer today is, of course, Alex Salmond's last appearance at First Minister's Questions. His time as Scotland's longest-serving First Minister will be properly acknowledged next Tuesday. So in the meantime, can I invite him just once to astound us all and actually answer a question? But briefly, briefly, can I ask the First Minister if he could describe himself in just one word? What would that be? First Minister... No. <laughs> One word seems hardly adequate for that task. <laughs> Although if I could say to Fergus Ewing that his words might have been better addressed to the coming First Minister <laughs> rather than the departing one. <laughs> Jackie Bailey. As ever, the First Minister is in denial. I asked for one word. I asked for one word, but actually I got a whole dictionary full. Presiding officer, there are many words I could have used to describe the First Minister. Humble, <laughs> sensitive, modest, meek, perhaps even bashful. But you know, it's interesting that he didn't use the word proud, because if I were him, I wouldn't be entirely proud of this government's record either. Yeah. Teacher numbers down, college places down, NHS bed numbers down, oh, waiting lists up. This week, this week, the First Minister has been giving advice to Nicola Sturgeon about who should be in her cabinet. And, you know, he knows I always like to be helpful. So let me offer suggestions as perhaps who to keep out. How about... Mike Russell for failing yeah, yeah. Scotland's young people, Alex Neil for failing Scotland's patients, or perhaps even Kenny McCaskill relegated today to the second row for the many failings that appear on his charge sheet. Presiding officer, given their record of failure, can I ask the First Minister which members of his cabinet would he recommend keep their jobs when his deputy takes over? First Minister. Well, uh, if there's a mood to miss, Jackie Bailey has an unerring ability to miss it. Uh, I, I've actually been doing some research uh, uh, in these matters. Over the years, the Labour Party have called for the resignation of each and every one of my Cabinet secretaries. The only person they haven't called on to resign is me. <laughs> and I'm the one who's resigning. <laughs> Does this not represent the Labour Party's unerring ability to miss the target at each and every occasion? Jackie Bailey. First Minister, I think I've captured the mood. You're going anyway. And, you know, he usually heaps such praise on his ministers. Clearly, his ministers are in exceptionally good company. That admiration is usually reserved for Vladimir Putin or Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. Presiding officer, you know, the First Minister says he's resigning because he lost the referendum campaign and believes somebody has to take responsibility for that defeat. 
This was his life's ambition. He spent millions of taxpayers' money on the referendum. He put Scotland on, on pause, and despite a derided UK coalition, he still lost by 400,000 votes. So he's going, and the person who actually ran the Yes campaign, Nicola Sturgeon, gets the keys to Butte House. But her record in government, her record in government is not too clever either. Child poverty is growing. Fuel poverty is growing. House building at its lowest level since the Second World War. We are told that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister are joined at the hip. Isn't it therefore the case that changing the First Minister will actually make very little difference? First Minister. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think... Uh, uh, talking about changing leaders is the Labour Party's strongest suit. <laughs> ja Jackie Bailey is actually the, the tenth leader or caretaker leader that I've faced over the dispatch box, uh, and all of them have had her grace and charity <laughs> with which she uh, addresses the, the chamber. But Nicola Sturgeon should be assured, on the track record, once she becomes First Minister, the Labour Party will not ask for her resignation. <laughs> it's only as Deputy First Minister and my other uh, Cabinet Secretaries. I, I think the, the administration has had a substantial record of achievement over these last seven years. But in many ways, it doesn't matter what I think about it. Surely it's what the people of Scotland think about it. Yeah. Uh, and if I could remind Jackie Bailey, uh, that this government was re-elected with an overall majority in a proportional parliament. Uh, and if we believe the more recent indications, that support seems to be growing, not diminishing. So all in all, I, I think I would rather stand here uh, as First Minister, albeit departing, uh, than the 10th leader or caretaker leader <laughs> who has faced me over this dispatch box. <laughs> I noticed the praise he heaped on the Deputy First Minister, but you know, perhaps he meant to do so only in terms of the debate. And that might be a useful title for his autobiography. But, Presiding Officer, let me just genuinely say, today does mark the end of an era. No one can deny Alex Salmon's passion for Scotland. Nobody can deny his love of his country. But the real tragedy is that he was so blinkered by his passion for independence that powers he already had, powers to tackle poverty, to reduce inequality, to deliver social justice, were pushed into second place. For the last seven years, the First Minister has used his age-old excuse that somehow it was Westminster's fault. But we hear he wants to go back there. The First Minister even believes he could be the Deputy Prime Minister. He has gone from urging Scots to vote for Nick Clegg to wanting to be Nick Clegg. Is it, presiding officer, After. is it not the case, is it not the case that his real legacy is leaving Scotland more divided than ever? And before he answers, before he answers, I know from his first response that brevity is not his strong point. So let me, let me, offer, let me offer one final word to the First Minister. Cheerio! First Minister. Well, how can I break the mood, Doug? <laughs> can I say to uh, Jackie Bailey that... Uh, uh, whoever stands for the SNP in the Westminster Parliament would seem, according to the polls, to have a reasonable chance of success <laughs> at, the present, uh, uh, at the present moment. I, I think there have been uh, substantial achievements, uh, if I could name but two, the reintroduction of free education yeah, yeah, uh, in yeah. Scotland. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Uh, and looking forward again, again in the teeth of Labour opposition, uh, the uh, introduction of free school meals in primary one to three, I think that's a substantial move forward in terms of Scottish uh, uh, society. But if I could say, despite all of these leaders that I faced uh, from the, the Labour Party, uh, the continuing failure of that party to establish or to even redress the decline and collapse in its fortunes, if I could add her piece of advice, 
and the final word, which she can translate to her leader, whoever that it may be. The people in Scotland do no longer know what the Labour Party stands for. They don't know. But they do know who they stood with yes. in the referendum campaign. And any political party in alliance with the Tory party is destined to destruction in Scotland, and that is exactly what's happening to the branch office before us now. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Prime Minister. First uh, Minister. No current plans, and I would have to be reasonably quick if I was going to do so. Ms. Davidson. <laughs> I'm sure the First Minister will join with me in welcoming the good news uh, yesterday that showed employment is up, unemployment is down, and that earnings are outstripping inflation. And I think that that is a credit to both of Scotland's governments. It would, of course, be churlish for politicians not to recognise success. However, it is more damaging not to recognise where work needs to be done. In Scotland, our levels of educational attainment are stagnating. There is no improvement in reducing reconviction rate among offenders. The gap in research and development funding between Scotland and other EU nations is as big as ever, and people's satisfaction with their public services is worsening. The First Minister has once again today recited polls as a measure of success, but don't these facts show up a record that falls well short of his own claims? First Minister. Uh, substantial uh, achievements uh, in both uh, education and uh, in health, key public uh, services. The people's respect for the health service is increasing, which I think is a fantastic testament uh, in these times of, of austerity that our health service and our doctors and nurses, our staff throughout the health service have achieved that. Uh, of course, educational attainment in Scotland is rising, not falling. Yeah. Uh, and the successful introduction of Curriculum for Excellence gives us uh, uh, great hope uh, uh, for the future. Uh, I, I did, and I should correct my, uh, my letter, my uh, earlier answer, because I do intend to send uh, another letter to the Prime Minister today, uh, asking him exactly to explain the remarks of the, uh, of the Head of the Navy, Admiral Zambellis, who seemed to cast doubt uh, on whether the contracts uh, for the global ships are going to be awarded to the Clyde Yards. And I'm sure Rafe Davidson will join with me uh, in, in saying these remarks are, are deeply troubling. Uh, they come not from some functionary in the Ministry of Defence, but uh, the head of the, the Navy. Uh, and uh, this Parliament uh, will demand that the commitments and promises that have been made are honoured to the Clyde workers. Yeah. Yeah. Ruth uh, First Minister well knows that admirals don't award contracts, the MOD awards contracts. But it's interesting that he takes... Well, it's interesting that he challenged the facts that I provided to him earlier on, on all of these areas of policy because it turns out that I was only reading his own government's assessment of his own government's performance as contained in the Scottish Government report card called Scotland Performs that I took off his own government's website this morning. And I've got it here. It says that it provides at a glance snapshot of how Scotland and the government are doing. And there's more. In a section entitled performance at a glance, there are 11 key targets that this SNP government has rightly set itself with which to measure its own progress. Only two show any performance improvement whatsoever. On the other hand, raising economic growth to the UK level, performance worsening, matching GDP growth rate of small EU uh, countries, performance worsening, productivity, performance worsening, healthy life expectancy, performance worsening, these are the measures that the First Minister set upon which to judge his devolved administration. And he's failed. For seven years, he has stood there and said only with the powers of independence. But the people of Scotland looked at that plan too, and they said that his performance wasn't up to much either. So one last time, can I ask the First Minister, is this really a record worthy of so much self-satisfaction? Yeah. First Minister... Uh, can I point out in Scotland performs over the period since 2007 there's been substantial rises in the vast majority of, of the indices but can I pick up on one point of, uh, of detail because I, I looked very carefully uh, I was surprised at the comparator between UK and Scottish growth because uh, Scotland had a shallower recession and a faster recovery uh, and I found out that it's not because 
uh, Scotland has fallen behind the UK. It is because the UK have revised their statistics. That George Osborne, in his keenness and anxiety to revise the UK statistics, and the Scottish ones haven't been revised as yet, included the black economy. Yes. It, it included a whole range of matters which it wouldn't be delicate to go into uh, in this Parliament. He included charitable work, uh, which, given the Tories' treatment of the third sector, I thought was a, a, a bit rich, and as a result, managed to inflate the UK growth figures. And what happened? They were then surprised when they were landed a £1.7 billion <laughs> bill by the European <laughs> Union. Not because the economy had improved, but because they'd instructed the officials and statisticians to change the statistics. It's not surprising to any of us that the Tory party depend on the record by including the black economy in the figures. This is what they've been doing uh, for the generation, but in true generosity of spirit to, to Ruth Davidson. I, I know that, uh, as yet at least, uh, she hasn't managed to revive the fortunes of the Scottish Conservative Party. I thought the 8% in last week's opinion polls was a particularly unlikely uh, figure, but certainly single figures seems to be the direction in which they're heading. However, she has a single, almost monumental political triumph. She's destroyed the fortunes of the other opposition parties <laughs> in this Parliament. She destroyed the fortunes of the Liberal Party by going into coalition with them at Westminster. And she destroyed the fortunes of the Labour Party by the Better Together Alliance. In that respect, on the judgment, on the criteria of destroying other opposition political parties, Ruth Davison is undoubtedly the most brilliant political leader in the history of the Scottish Parliament. Thank you, President Officer, for an opportunity just to say a few short words. Can I join others in and other people inside and outside of Parliament to pay tribute to the personal achievements of the First Minister? We'll get a fuller opportunity next week to elaborate on that. But it's been a long journey since the days back in 2004 when he rejected standing for his party's leadership. If nominated, I'll decline. If drafted, I'll defer. And if elected, I'll resign. Presiding officer, can I just check that he definitely is going? <laughs> First Minister. Uh, uh, I, I was actually quoting the wrong American general. I, I, I meant to generally quote General McCarthy, you know, I shall return was what I, I just got my generals. I just got my generals mixed up. Uh, Nicholas Sturgeon wants to know what the answer to your question is. <laughs> This is the first time I've been heckled by the SNP in demanding <laughs> answers <laughs> answer the question. Can I uh, welcome uh, Willie Rennie back to, back to his place uh, uh, in the Parliament? Can I, I thank him for his uh, uh, kind remarks? Uh, and could I say that one of the first things I found in, in Butte House, in a cupboard actually, all discovered, was a, a silver tray which had been presented to the Right Honourable John Scott Maclay uh, the occasion of the inauguration of the fourth bridge, uh, uh, the fourth road bridge in 1958. And I did some research uh, because Ro John Scott Maclay was not a Conservative. He was the last of the National Liberals. He had been appointed by Harold uh, Macmillan to that place. And apparently, I'm told by senior civil servants, he used to go about St Andrew's House saying, I have made a decision. I shall now go and consult the Conservative Party. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, is there not, a moral tale <laughs> in the Right Honourable John Scott Maclay, as a national liberal in alliance with the Conservative Party, he was the last of his kind. <laughs> Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the First Minister what potential impact on jobs at the Scotson Yard in my constituency of Glasgow Annie's Land could the MOD's considerations on building the Type 26 frigates in France have? First Minister. Well, I, I think uh, Ruth Davison was uh, over-relaxed on, on this matter. I mean, we're not talking about some mid-ranking uh, official. Uh, we're talking about the first sea lord. Uh, and the quote from the first sea lord cast doubt uh, on where the order would be placed, or even the country it would be placed in, and that is exactly what the first sea lord 
had to say. So obviously, if that were to happen, there would be a, an impact of uh, some thousands of jobs. But I, I think more so, and I hope the Parliament can unite on this. It would be a total and absolute and complete betrayal. But you cannot shrug these things off and say, well, that doesn't matter what the First Sea Lord says. The First Sea Lord is presumably in a good position to know the state of the contract negotiations. And that is why this Parliament, with a resonant voice, should say it would be totally unacceptable for these orders not to come to the Clyde Yards. Yeah. Leo MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. CERCO's latest profit warning this week and confirmation that it is writing down £1.5 billion in losses on various public contracts comes as the result of what their chief executive suggested were two strategic missteps, diversifying away from core business and focusing too much on winning new business. One example of both is the contract awarded to CERCO by Scottish ministers in 2012 to pr provide ferry services to the Northern Isles. Given this week's revelations, what reassurance can the First Minister offer my constituents that there will be no knock-on impact on CERCO's ability to continue delivering lifeline ferry services to the communities Tavish Scott and I represent? And will the Scottish Government be reviewing the way the contract was tendered to ensure that each bid was considered appropriately and that each bidder was offering something they could deliver? Well, the, the reassurance is this, that, that her CERCO will be held absolutely to the terms of, of the contract. I, and I'm sure my successor and indeed the Transport Minister uh, will be able to reassure the local member that absolutely it will be the case. That CERCO are under new leadership, of course, but nonetheless the contract will be held to and that will be enforced. Question three, Angus MacDonald. To ask the First Minister what response he has received from the Prime Minister to his recent correspondence regarding European Council fisheries negotiations. First Minister. Well, I have had a totally unsatisfactory response uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the Prime Minister. Uh, on uh, Monday, the Agriculture and Fisheries Committee meeting, the main area of fisheries policy under discussion were the deep sea stock regulations. Scotland has a dominant interest in this activity, with landings of these species by vessels in membership of the Scottish producer organisations are in the region of 95 per cent of all UK landings this year. Uh, in my view, supported by the Labour Party on this occasion, uh, I think it is absurd that the Prime Minister put the interests of this vital Scottish industry in the hands of an unelected peer, Lord Rupert Ponsonby, the seventh Baron de Molly. The key thing about the Baron de Molly is he has had no interest or experience whatsoever in fisheries matters. Uh, the fact that this breaks a, a clear commitment given by the uh, Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary in 2010 uh, is totally unacceptable, but perhaps in the light of the Conservative Party's attitude to wider issues in Scotland, not totally surprising. Angus MacDonald. I thank the First Minister for his reply. Does he agree with me that if we are a family of nations, as David Cameron has described the UK, it is only right that the UK Government should respect the devolution settlement as it affects foreign policy, particularly with, re with regard to issues of such importance to Scotland as fisheries, in the same way as states like Belgium have done uh, for some time? First Minister. Yes, I do. Uh, and this was exactly the point that was raised back at the, the Joint uh, Ministerial Committee back in 2010. Fiona Hislop, uh, uh, as the European Minister, was in attendance at that meeting and can uh, verify everything I have got to say. And when this position was explained of how few times uh, Scottish ministers were able to represent key Scottish interests arguing for a UK position, in terms of the fishing negotiations, the Prime Minister, the incoming Prime Minister then said this was uh, something he would put right. He said that he could see the strongest argument for that happening on key issues. It has happened once over the last four years, despite the fact that Richard Lockhead has attended each and every Fisheries Council meeting, is by far the most experienced fisheries minister in the European continent, never mind uh, in these Islands. So it is totally unacceptable that something so uh, blithely given as a commitment in 2010 uh, should not be adhered to in a vital negotiation in 2014. Uh, and as I say, there may be a lesson for Scotland uh, in wider matters that unless this Prime Minister's feet are held to the fire, then commitments will not be redeemed. Question four, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government considers that the devolution of health and safety legislation would lead to more prosecutions where serious injury or death has occurred. First Minister. I, I think this Parliament would be wise to pay close attention to the words of Graeme Smith, the General Secretary of the SDUC, who said, we believe that it is due to lack of proactive inspection 
uh, a policy forced on the HSE by a government to refuse to acknowledge the need of the HSE to be autonomous. Uh, these are uh, significant comments, as indeed is the STEC uh, submission uh, to the Smith Commission. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for his answer. As you will be aware, Scotland has a higher proportion of workplace fatalities than the rest of the UK due to the numbers we have employed in high-risk sectors such as construction, fishing and agriculture. Does he agree that the 35 per cent cut in the health and safety budget by the UK coalition government has directly impacted not only on the number of prosecutions, 98 per cent of which are successful, but also therefore on the delivery of justice for the victims of workplace accidents and their families? First Minister. Well, it, it can't be a coincidence that these cuts to the health and safety executive budget have coincided with a dramatic fall in prosecutions. Uh, and I think it was one of the key arguments uh, that the SDC put forward when arguing that devolution of health and safety would allow us to ensure that we have a system that protects workers uh, wherever they work, but does not constrain businesses through undue regulation. I think it's a highly serious matter, and Kenneth Gibson is quite right to raise it in this chamber. Question number five, Graham Pearce. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Law Society of Scotland's discussion paper, Legal Assistance in Scotland, which says that the current system is not fit for purpose. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Legal Aid Board makes hundreds of thousands of grants of legal assistance each year, whether to help people deal with welfare benefit problems or to help those accused of criminal offences to defend themselves. Expenditure on legal assistance last year was £150.5 <coughs> Now, the Scottish Legal, Board, Legal Aid Board's annual report shows that since 2011, changes to the legal system have saved the public purse £52 million, but there is still more to do. Now, the Law Society's paper is intended to open up discussion. We do have some points of shared perspective, such as the need for simplification. And we will, of course, be taking a detailed look at the Law Society's proposals over the coming weeks, with a view to assessing their potential impact, both on public funds and, of course, those who rely on legal aid. Graham Pearson. President <coughs> Officer, I am grateful to the First Minister for that reply. The First Minister may remember I raised concerns last year regarding proposed changes to legal aid. The President of the Law Society of Scotland indicated this week legal aid cuts are likely to curb the rights to justice for people on low and modest incomes who rely on legal aid. Does the First Minister agree with me that the prospect of citizens of modest means being denied access as the Law Society suggests, whilst career criminals repeatedly access legal aid unfettered, is indefensible and a foreseeable consequence arising from Mr McCaskill's changes. Will he use whatever influence he has to ensure that this situation is addressed by his successor as a matter of urgency? Well, can I, <coughs> I point out to, to Graham Pearson, uh, as he will know, that uh, expenditure on legal assistance has been held in Scotland since 2007 at £150 million. Uh, But, of course, that is not what has happened south of the border, uh, where there have been very substantial cuts. Well, Labour members should understand that under the Barnett formula, the consequentials that come to Scotland are directed by expenditure in England. Uh, and unless they, they put forward a position where the great resources of Scotland can be available for the Scottish people to direct our own spending, then these matters, I am afraid, are relevant. And Graham Pearson should also understand that while there was some aspects of the Law Society's submission, which, which uh, we were extremely interested, the need for simplification, uh, for example. He will know that it itself has proved deeply controversial, as you will see from the debate which is opening up and people pointing out uh, that many areas of civil law uh, are vitally important uh, in terms of the legal aid assistance and criminal lawyers pointing out that the fundamental right to defend yourself against a criminal charge is the essence of a free uh, society. So there are no easy answers to these questions at the present moment, but he can rest assured that what this government does and uh, what uh, an immediately future government will do will be to protect the right of the people of Scotland to legal assistance so that they can pursue their claims for justice. Question six, Alison Johnson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on underground coal gasification and whether any licences have been granted for exploration. First Minister. Well, the, the Coal Authority, which is, of course is a UK non-departmental public body sponsored by the Department of Energy and Climate Change, have issued six licences for underground 
coal gasification in Scotland. All of these licences are offshore Scotland or in estuaries. However, no underground coal gasification project can proceed in Scotland without a range of other permissions, including local planning and environmental consents, which of course are devolved issues. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. The First Minister will, will be aware that of the scientific consensus that says we already have far too many fossil fuels to burn safely. Will the First Minister agree that his legacy should be a Scotland that meets its climate change targets, that leads the world in climate justice, and that delivers thousands of more new jobs in renewables? And does he agree that the Scottish Government must use the powers it has to stop the damaging and destructive distraction of unconventional gas extraction in Scotland? First Minister. The Scottish Government recognises uh, uh, the concerns that Alison Johnson has, but also recognises that we have to see the potential for new energy technologies. We also recognise the potential synergies between technologies like underground coal gasification and carbon capture and storage, where CO2 emissions could be captured at source and transported for storage off uh, offshore, making it a, uh, an extremely effective environmental process. Scotland, as she'll know, has world-leading expertise <coughs> in carbon capture and storage with an excellent comparative advantage, such as access to vast offshore storage of CO2. I would be very clear that when it comes to new technologies, we need to proceed cautiously and take an evidence-based approach <coughs> to ensure the environment is protected and, above all, that local communities' concerns are properly taken into account. And I know that Alison Johnston will accept that whatever other a range of criticisms might be levelled at the administration over the last seven and a half years. Lack of enthusiasm for renewable energy <laughs> it could not be one of them. And I am sure that uh, she, like me, looks forward to, to celebrating a, a milestone which we are sure will be achieved in the very near future, uh, and that will be 50 per cent of Scotland's uh, effective demand for electricity is likely to be secured for from renewable sources. That is a, a transformative initiative over the, the last seven years. And I'm sure that Alison Johnson and I have common cause in that enthusiasm and that record. Mardo Fraser. Thank you. Yesterday, the world-renowned energy expert, Professor Dieter Helm of Oxford University, described Alex Salmond's energy policy as nonsense. Will he be advising his successor as First Minister to rethink this nonsense policy? First Minister. Well, of course, the Conservative Party and the UK coalition described the Liberal Democrat energy policy as nonsense, eh, and the Liberal Democrats in the coalition at Westminster described the Conservative Party's <laughs> energy policy eh, as nonsense. I think uh, an energy policy which uh, we have been able to pursue in Scotland to see that surge forward in renewable uh, energy is an extremely effect effective one indeed. Of course, it would be fantastic if there were other areas of energy policy that had been under the control of this Parliament. I, I would like, for example, not to have seen the total chaos that has resulted in the electricity markets, threatening the people of England with blackouts or brownouts in the very near future as a result of coalition policies at, uh, at Westminster. I would have liked to have seen things like oil and gas under the control of uh, this uh, Scottish Parliament. So the great natural resources of Scotland uh, could be invested in the future of the Scottish economy. And how disappointing it is that once upon a time Murdo Fraser was in the vanguard of Scottish Conservative thinking, if that is not a contradiction in terms. <laughs> But now, meekly, in this probable last question to me, comes to this chamber, diminishing the ability of this parliament and a future administration to control <laughs> energy policy light years ahead of what has happened to us and what has remained to Westminster. Yeah. That ends the last First Minister's questions by First Minister Alex Salmond. Uh, we now move on to members' business. I'll allow a short pause for those who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly.